Hello and welcome to Miss Book Owl's Book Review. The book I'd like to discuss today is called In the Sea There Are Crocodiles by Fabio Gita. If that's how you pronounce the name, if not, correct me. Now in this book, it is um, based on a true story of this little boy's life, of his journey. I'm going to call him Ina. I can't pronounce his full name. Now, this little boy lived in Afghanistan with his mom, his um, brother and sister. His dad died when he was six. His dad was killed. They belonged to a group called the Hazara, I think it's called, the Hazara. Now, in Afghanistan, the Hazara are not treated very well. They're branded as outsiders. They have Asian features, narrow eyes, flattish noses, and broad cheeks. They look Asian. Um, many say they're descendants of the Mongolians and directly of Genghis Khan. Many of the ruling Taliban at that time saw the Hazara as very low. And there was a saying that the Hazara um, would go to, should go to Goristan, which means to the graveyard. They had this saying, and they would talk about the different groups in, in Afghanistan, and the Hazara should go to the graveyard. That's, they, they were nothing. They should be dead. They weren't treated very well. They didn't look like them. They, they, um, were Muslim, but they, I, I believe they were Shia Muslim. And I guess the beliefs or the, their um, traditions were a little bit different than the other Muslim groups. So they were. Um, many people, many of the other, especially the Taliban, um, did not like the Hazara. Okay. So this little boy, Ina's father, was basically turned into a slave. He was told that he had to go to Iran and buy products. And. Um, take it back to these people and I think they're called the Pashtun to so they could sell these products in their store and he was told that if he didn't do this they would kill his family so he I don't know if they paid him hopefully they paid him something but he was basically a, like a slave you know, he, he couldn't choose any other job he had to do that job or his family would be killed one day he was robbed and all his possessions were stolen all the stuff that he'd bought in Iran now these people went to the mother, the widow, and said, you owe us now, you know, he, this guy, your husband got himself killed and he lost all our stuff and now you have to pay us the money. He went, I think they went to um, her brother and tried to get him to pay and then they said they were going to take her sons and turn them into slaves. And she was terrified for her sons. And then this is how the story starts off, okay? One day she decides to take her oldest son, Ina, to Pakistan. And it's a place in Pakistan, I can't quote, Quieta, Q-U-E-T-T-A. I believe there's a lot of Hazara in that particular area. She took them there, and they stayed at this kind of a hostel. And the little boy, Ina, had no idea what was going on. You know, he was with his mom. They stayed in this little room, and then one night, the mom sat him down and hugged him and before he was going to go to bed and said, Listen, I want you to promise me these things. I want you to promise me. And she said it in a very, it's, it's beautiful the way it's written. It's very, it flows. It's very easy to read. The font is relatively large, so it's not a hard book to read. And it's wonderful. You'll laugh, you'll cry, and you'll want to read. You'll want to care about what happens to Ina. You do care what happens to Ina. He's a remarkable little boy. He's incredible. Anyway, she um, takes him aside and she says, please don't I don't want you to steal or cheat or take drugs or use weapons. And she says it, and you have to read at the very beginning of the book to find out exactly how she um, says it to him. Well, the little Ina has no idea why she's saying this. But when he um, wakes up the next day, she's gone. And he's left, penniless, without, it, without any support system whatsoever in this little hostel. And he's only 10 years old. And the book is his journey, how he survives. Now, this little Ina moves. It's a journey. He moves from country to country trying to survive. He could have just stayed in the hostel. He could have just hid and stayed in the hostel, and he could have grown old there. But he had courage enough to leave. He didn't want to stay there because he asked the, 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 the owner, and the owner said, okay, you can stay there one day. You can. I will give you... 
food for one day. You can stay for one night, then you have to leave and go on the streets, okay? I remember Ena had written that he was terrified. He wanted to run, and he wanted to hold on to the man's neck and brag and scream and say, please, please, don't kick me out. He was terrified, but he didn't do that. He said thank you for, for your kindness, and he took his little onion and potato, and he, you know, imagine that, having no support whatsoever in a strange country. You don't know the language. You have no one to take care of you. You're only 10. The next day, the hostel owner decides to keep him on for room and board. I mean, so he's not going to pay him any money, but he can stay in the place and he can, he'll feed him. And he works this little guy really hard. Now, this story is very descriptive. It kind of has an Oliver Twist flavor to it, but it's, you know, you look at all these poor little kids, what they have to do to survive. I mean, it's not just the story of Vina. Of course, it's the story of Vina, but it's also the story of all the other children that he meets along the way and their journey and what they have to go through. And what's remarkable is how there is this sense of community and support, how they help one another in some cases. There's help and there's kindness. Um, he meets kind people, incredibly kind people. He meets cruel, hateful people. Um, this story, you're, you're sitting on the edge of your seat the whole time you're reading it. Sometimes I'd be reading the story and I'd be thinking, I can't believe this is happening. I'd be so, I was so scared for him. The whole time I read this book, I was so terrified for Ina. But I was so proud of him, too. What a, what a courageous boy. And he showed such strength and fierceness. And he would stand up for people and he would help people. So he was just this incredible character. And you look at, at people um, that are suffering in different third, third world countries and people say, oh, why give them... You know, when the kids are begging, you know, because he took, had took another job where he had to sell stuff on the street, and that's, this is only the beginning of the story where he has to sell things in a little cardboard box, and he has to go up to people and please buy, please buy. That's how he's going to survive. That's how he's going to eat for the night. He has to sell something. He gets a percentage of whatever he sells. If he doesn't sell anything, he doesn't eat. And some people have really callous attitudes and go, well, you know, you don't give a person a fish. You teach them how to fish. And, you know... These assholes that, you know, they, they probably don't know what it's like to not have any food or to suffer. Yes, teach them how to fish, but in the meantime, give them a fish, right? The, the times that he had uh, got a little bit of extra food, that, gave, that gives you the strength. That gave him the strength to get up the next day and try again, you know? It gives him that little bit of hope. When you help someone, you give them that little bit of hope to not give up. So when people say, I, I don't do that sort of thing, you know, I don't, then they should be in that situation and see how they like it. Because even buying that one little pack of gum or that one little sock, buying a pair of socks from someone, you're thinking, it will make a difference. Yes, it will make a difference. It made a difference in his life to sell that pair of socks because it meant that he could buy himself a little bowl of soup that day, which gave him the strength to continue on his journey. And he ends up moving all the way from, so he went, he was in Afghanistan, his mom took him to Pakistan. He moved from Pakistan and he had to go through human traffickers to get to these different places. And it's just, oh, you have to read the story for yourself to find out just what he had to go through. And after, so after Pakistan, he went to Iran and then from Iran I believe he went to Turkey, and then from Turkey, he went to Greece, and that's quite a story, his journey to Greece, and then from Greece to Italy. And I'm going to read you this one little part of this book, uh, one of his journeys, just something. Okay, this is one of the journeys. They split us up to avoid problems insofar as that was possible, given that we were walking all day, shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow, with different strides, but at the same speed. And when you're in a situation like that, 
making a lot of effort in uncomfortable circumstances with not much food and not much water and nowhere to rest and it's very very cold then squabbles and brawls and even knife fights are always on the cards so it's best to keep the hostile ethnic groups apart this is when they're in the mountains going to um i think this is when they're going to from turkey to iran i think after an hour spent walking along a very rough dirt path we were stopped halfway up a hill by a shepherd accompanied by a dog madly chasing his own tail the dog not the shepherd he asked to speak to the leader of the expedition who without a second thought took some money from his jacket and paid him to stop him giving us away to the police the shepherd counted the money slowly very slowly then put it inside his hat and signaled to us to continue as I passed him, the old man looked at me straight in the eyes, as if to tell me something, but I didn't know what. By night, we walked. By day, we slept, or tried to. At the end of the third day, because the traffickers back in Tehran, our cousin's friend, had told us the journey would last three days and three nights, we wanted to know how much... ...longer it would be before we would get to the top of the mountain. To us it still seemed to be as far as ever and started descending towards Turkey. But we were all too scared to ask any questions. So we drew lots and I was the, the one picked out. So it's like, has an Oliver twist, you know. When, when he had, we had to draw lots and Oliver was the one who asked, who had to ask for more food. I approached one of the smugglers and said, Aga, please, how long is it before we get to the top of the mountain? Without looking at me, at me, he replied, a few hours. I went back to my friends and said, a few hours. We walked until just before dawn, then stopped. The muscles in our legs were as hard as concrete. At sunset, as usual, we set off again. He lied to you, said Farid. I already realized that, I said, thanks. But your cousin wasn't very accurate either when he told us how long it would take. You have to ask someone else. After an hour, I approached another of, of the Iranians who had a Kashnikov across his shoulder. Aga, please, I said, falling into step beside him. How long is it before we get to the top of the mountain? Not long, he replied, without even looking at me. But does not long mean Aga? What does not long mean Aga before dawn? I went back to my friend and said, it won't be long. If we keep up a good pace, we'll get there before dawn. Now, there's something else I wanted to read. Oh, yeah. Oh. Early one morning. It was dark, and we were clambering over the rocks on our hands and knees. A Bengali boy got into difficulty. I don't know what it was, maybe a breathing problem, or maybe his heart, but he fell and slid down over the snow for several meters. We started yelling, Wait, somebody's dying here. We have to stop and help him. But the traffickers, there were five of them, fired into the air with their, I can't, Kashnikov, some kind of a gun. Anyone who doesn't start walking again immediately stays here forever, they said. We tried to help the young Bengali to take him by the arms and under the armpits to help him up and get him to walk, but it was too much for us. He was too heavy. We were too tired and too everything. It wasn't possible. We abandoned him. As he rounded a bend, I could still hear his voice for a moment. Then it faded completely, swallowed by the wind. On the 15th day, there was a knife fight between a Kurd and a Pakistani, I don't know what they were fighting over, food maybe, or maybe nothing at all. The Kurd ended up lo the loser. We abandoned him, too. On the 16th day, for the first time, I talked to a Pakistani boy who wasn't much older than I was. Afghans and Pakistanis usually didn't talk much to each other. As we walked, we were in one of those areas where the wind wasn't too bad, and we were able to speak. I asked him where he was headed, where he was heading, and what he planned to do and where he planned to go after we got to Instabil. Please excuse my pronunciations. He didn't reply immediately. He seemed lost in thought. He looked at me as if he wasn't sure he understood the question. 
with a kind of expression on his face that seemed to say, What an idiot. London, he said, walking faster to get away from me. Later I discovered that all the Pakistanis were the same. They never said Turkey or Europe. They just said London. If any of them were in a good mood and asked me, How about you? I would have said, Somewhere. <laughs>